Are you familiar with the mystery surrounding the role that Robert Knudsen, the official White House photographer, played in the autopsy of President Kennedy's body? Join me today in this week's segment of The Libertarian Angle as I talk about the story of Robert Knudsen. I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's segment of The Libertarian Angle. The show, as you all know, brings you the principled and compromising case for libertarianism, which we've done for 30 years at the Future of Freedom Foundation. And I'm ordinarily joined by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, professor of economics at the Citadel, but this is Thanksgiving week, and Richard's uh, doing Thanksgiving stuff, and so could not make it uh, with me today. And so I'm going to do a solo performance for you, and I'm going to address a subject that I've spent a lot of time addressing over the years, and that's the regime change operation that took place in Dallas on November 22, 1963, especially given that this is the annual anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. As you all know, we have long maintained at FFF that this was a regime change operation. The Pentagon, the CIA, had been waging a vicious war with Kennedy, practically from the time he was uh, inaugurated. Uh, there was the CIA's conspiracy to assassinate Patrice Lumumba, which Kennedy fervently opposed. Uh, Kennedy favored these third world movements, independence movements, and the CIA and the Pentagon viewed them as pro-communist uh, activities. And then, of course, there was the Bay of Pigs, and then there was Operation Northwoods and the, the Pentagon's insistence on invading Cuba because they considered Cuba a, a dagger, a communist dagger pointed at America's throat. And Kennedy, of course, refused to, to uh, go along with Operation Northwoods, refused to invade Cuba. And then there was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then all this culminates, which, which the Joint Chiefs of Staff, at least one of them, said it was the greatest defeat in America's history. Imagine a military general saying this is the greatest defeat in, in American history. And that was their mindset. They believed that Kennedy was soft on communism, that he was going to surrender to the, to the Soviets and the Chinese communists because of his policies. Um, Kennedy had gone to American University in June of 63, and declared an end to the Cold War. He clearly had seen it as a racket that it was. And, of course, this was going to put an end to the, all the largesse that was going to be accumulating for the military-industrial complex over the next several decades. So Kennedy was clearly moving America in a totally different direction from what the Pentagon and the CIA wanted and felt was necessary for terms of national security. Kennedy was even proposing a joint rocket ship trip to the moon with, between the United States and the Soviet Union. Imagine, that would have meant sharing rocket technology with the communists. Well, you can imagine what the reaction of the Pentagon and the CIA was to that. There, then there was the um, nuclear test ban treaty and then, Q, and then Kennedy's decision to start pulling troops out of Vietnam. He was going to put an end to that, which of course would have meant no more Vietnam War. So there was clearly this war that was going on that culminates in the Pentagon and the CIA prevailing in this war, much like 10 years later the Chilean military would wage war against their president and they would prevail as well. Uh, so with the full support of the CIA and the Pentagon in that regime change operation as well. So that's, that's the, the thesis we have long maintained at FFF through our books and our articles and our videos and our conferences. Uh, Unlike or contrary to what people say, oh, Jacob, it's just a theory. We don't deal in theories. We deal in facts. And among the facts in this uh, regime change operation was the autopsy. This is what the mainstream press has never wanted to confront is the fraudulent autopsy. Uh, I mean, you, you look in vain for articles dealing with the fraudulent autopsy. You can't find them in the mainstream press. With, with a couple of exceptions, when the Assassination Records Review Board discovered that there were two separate brain examinations, one that necessarily could not have involved the president's brain because at the first brain examination, they sectioned or sliced the brain like a loaf of bread, which they're supposed to do in an autopsy and where there's a gunshot wound to the head. 
the second brain examination, you have a fully intact brain. It's damaged, but it's not sectioned. Well, there's no way a brain can reconstitute itself after it's been sliced up. And uh, the mainstream press, the Washington Post, Associated Press, did carry an artic articles on, on that particular matter. But the rest of the, the fraudulent nature of the autopsy, they have never wanted to confront. And the autopsy is key to understanding who conducted the assassination. Uh, you can check this out in my two books, The Kennedy Autopsy and The Kennedy Autopsy Two. The, there, there is one undisputed fact that even the mainstream press cannot dispute. This is, this is not a theory. It is a fact that the U.S. military conducted the autopsy. No question about that. Everybody agrees on that. Um, so if we start there and we start realizing that there's a fraudulent autopsy taking place, and I've detailed that in my two books along with several articles and videos on, online, along with a, an excellent video series on our website called Altered History by Douglas Horn, who served on the Assassination Records Review Board, it, it's clear that this was a fraudulent autopsy. And so you, you have to ask yourself through deductive reasoning, why would the military conduct a fraudulent autopsy? And if you look at the, at the fraudulent autopsy, it wasn't just the military that was conducting it. There was clearly a deep state, deeper state aspect to this because the, the autopsy physicians, at least one of them, Colonel Pierre Fink, acknowledged that he was not permitted to dissect the neck wound, which is standard procedure in, a, in an autopsy, because somebody whose identity he could not remember, I think he was being disingenuous on that, I think he was scared to disclose the name of that person, but somebody in authority ordered him not to, which indicates that there is a deeper state aspect to this, to this autopsy. Well, ask yourself, how could they have planned a fraudulent autopsy uh, in, the, in just a, a few hours after the, the president is declared dead? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. You know what? They, they, they get on the phone and say, hey, how about having a fraudulent autopsy? Uh, Kennedy just got killed. No, things don't work that way. The fraudulent autopsy had to have been planned in advance. And uh, when you look at all the things they did, as I detailed in my two books, it's clear that this thing was pre-planned. Well, then the next question is, why would the military, the U.S. military, conduct a fraudulent autopsy? Well, because it's built into the assassination. I mean, they're not going to conduct a fraudulent autopsy to protect the Soviets or to protect the Cubans if they've assassinated the president. They're doing it to protect themselves and as a way to shut down the investigation that would lead to them, as I point out in my two books. Today I want to address one aspect of this that I've written about. You can Google the name Robert Knudsen on FFF's website and you can get a better handle on, on Knudsen's role in this. But I want to just highlight what happened here with, with Knudsen in this, this segment of the Libertarian Angle because it, it really sh goes to show you the fraudulent nature of this autopsy. Now, who is Robert Knudsen? Newson was the official White House photographer, not just for Kennedy, but also for Eisenhower during, during the eight years that Eisenhower was in, in office. He even goes back to the Truman administration. So Newson is this respectable, respected, credible, uh, very prominent guy who's in charge of the White House photographs. He's, he takes the photographs if there's any weddings, uh, people you know, near the White House or close, close to the White House. He took pictures of John Kennedy's kids. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, John John's first time walking, uh, Newsom was there taking those pictures. Uh, he, when the president would travel abroad and have uh, con consultations with people and so, and so forth, Newsom would be there. So Newsom was a very, very liked guy. He was a very prominent guy. People had the utmost respect for his capabilities. Well, you, I mean, he has to be a very stout guy to have lasted as the official photographer for three presidents. I mean, you know, a new president c comes in, usually he likes to have his own people around him. Well, they just kept Newtson there because Newtson knew what he was doing and everybody liked him and very credible guy. Now, to, to, to put what Newtson's role in this autopsy in context 
let me let me back up a, a minute. Many of you know that I've brought up the name Sandra Spencer in the past. Now, Sandra Spencer was another very credible employee of the federal government. She was in charge of the uh, White House laboratory, uh, photographic laboratory at the at the Navy photographic facility in Washington D.C. She had a top secret security clearance. She was a U.S. Navy petty officer. She worked closely with the White House on both classified photographs, non-classified photographs. She worked closely with Mrs. Kennedy on various projects, uh, closely with the president on, on classified photography. Uh, she was responsible for, for developing and working with the White House on uh, White House photography, both classified and unclassified. No one has ever challenged the credibility or the competence, the professionalism of Sandra Spencer. It would be virtually impossible to find a more credible witness than Sandra Spencer. Well, on the weekend of the assassination, um, well, in, in the 1990s, the Assassination Records Review Board summons uh, Sandra Spencer to testify. Now, what was the Assassination Records Review Board? Well, when the movie JFK came out, Oliver Stone's famous movie, it generated all kinds of controversy. The mainstream press went on the attack immediately, even before the movie came out, because Stone's thesis is the same as ours at FFF, that this was a regime change operation, a very sophisticated one carried out by the CIA and the Pentagon. And so what, what, what happens here is at the end of the, of the movie JFK, there's a blurb that says, after 30 years, the national security establishment is still keeping their records relating to the assassination secret based on national security. Well, this is ridiculous. I mean, if this was a lone nut assassination, which is what the official story is, what does that have to do with national security? And this is just a guy, supposedly, that's working in a building that says, hey, the president's coming by. I think I'm going to shoot him. And so the shooting takes place and all of a sudden everything is shrouded in secrecy national security the warren commission is meeting in secret what's this all about this is just a low nut right i mean just some guy that shoots the president well it was much more than that what was going on here so 30 years later the assassination records review review board discovers the existence of sandra spencer and as it is is a result well let me back up a second that, that after that blurb was published in, the, in, in the, uh, the movie JFK, there's this national outcry from people saying, hey, what's the story here? Why, why the secrecy? And so they demand an end to the secrecy. After 30 years, the, the, the CIA and the Pentagon, Secret Service, FBI, have to disclose their records. Now, somebody gave them 25 years. Many of the records were disclosed um, back in the 90s because the Assassination Records Review Board they're the agency that was brought into existence to enforce this law. But weirdly, they, they, now they got a lot of records released, and including uh, the testimony of, of Sandra Spencer, which I'll talk about in a minute. But weirdly, the law gave the CIA and the Pentagon 25 years to disclose all their records. Well, the ARRB is going out of existence in 1997, I think, or 98. So here you have this law that, you know, it says, well, you got 25 years, but you put out of existence the agency that enforces that law. And, of course, um, then when the 25 years came up in President Trump's, uh, the start of his term, the CIA begs uh, for uh, another extension based on national security. Trump defers to the authority of the national security establishment, says, okay, I'll give you another, I don't know, four or five years. And so the new deadline's October 2021. And we all know what's going to happen there. And, and there's no doubt that these are more incriminating records, uh, especially with respect to Oswald's trip to Mexico City. There's just no question about it. Why else would they keep it secret? And, and when they saw the, the, what assassination researchers were able to come up with the, with the records that were released in the 1990s, they understand the dangers that this last stash, and of course you'd save your most incriminating records for the last, they don't understand the dangers. So the ARRB comes into existence and they start you know, getting all these records released and many of them related to the autopsy. And here's where much of the incriminating evidence came in with respect to the fraudulent autopsy. Among them was Sandra Spencer. 
And of course, there's other examples of the fraud that, that are explained in my two books, the Kennedy autopsy and the Kennedy autopsy too, that I would invite you to, to buy and read. Well, Sandra Spencer comes before the board and tells a remarkable story. She said on the weekend of the assassination, she was asked to develop the autopsy photographs for President Kennedy. Now, she's, uh, she's told this is a classified operation. We all know what that means. Every military person knows what classified means. It means you, you don't ever release it. You go to the grave without releasing it. I mean, you, you can go and find military veterans today and, that had access to classified information, and you ask them, hey, well, what was it that you saw or knew? And they'll tell you, can't talk about it, can't talk about it. And, and that was Sandra Spencer's uh, position, very professional. She, she had kept her secret for 30 years. I mean, this was one of the advantages of the secrecy uh, surrounding the Kennedy assassination is that, and, and with the military involved uh, in the autopsy especially, the secrets were kept for many, many years. So Sandra Spencer says, okay, I, discl I, I developed these, these autopsy photographs for President Kennedy. She saw them. She was developing them. Well, they, the ARRB shows her the official photographs in the record, and she looks at them and <laughs> looks at them carefully and says, no, these are not the photographs I developed. The photographs I developed showed a large exercise wound in the back of President Kennedy's head. These photographs show the back of the wound to be intact. Just those are not the photographs I developed. <laughs> well, okay, so now you, you're facing a situation with two separate sets of photographs, okay? Autopsy photographs. <laughs> right there is prima facie evidence of fraud. And, and what was fascinating about Spencer's testimony is it matched up with what the, the Dallas treating physicians had said at Parkland Hospital. You can Google uh, at, uh, immediately after the, the, the president was declared dead. You can, you can Google Robert McClellan and see a renowned surgeon. He was only in his 30s there at the time, but he just recently passed away. And through these um, many interviews he gave over the years, he said that when he got to, uh, to trauma room one, he was where President Kennedy's, Kennedy was there. He was told to go to the head of the gurney and and they were you know, doing things to try to save the president. They were doing a tracheotomy because of the neck wound. And, um, but he goes to the head of the gurney and sees the back of the head and says, hey, guys, have you all seen this? And so all the doctors go there, and there's this huge, like, orange-sized wound in the back of his head in what's called the occipital region of the, of the, of the skull. There was um, cerebellum. No, there was... Um, I forget the aspect of, of the brain that was leaking out, but it's the lower back side of the brain. Uh, not the cerebellum, but nah, I forget. Uh, but they knew that he could not survive. And then that this big exercise wound, there were other people who verified it. Clint Hill, Secret Service agent who jumped on the back of the car to push Mrs. Kennedy in there. He saw it all the way to Parkland. Uh, treating, physician, treating nurses saw it. Audrey Bell, um, Diana Boren. Uh, they found a, a piece of occipital bone in Dealey Plaza, uh, the backside of the skull. Well, so you've got this, this official photograph that shows none of this. There's no hole there. So clearly you've got some fraud going on here. So this brings up Robert Knudsen. Now, Knudsen, on Friday of the assassination, is summoned to go to some undis unknown location to photograph the autopsy of the president. That, his wife verified this. Now, this is all before the ARRB in the 90s. By this time, he had passed away. So the passage of time assisted, and the secrecy had assisted the, uh, the, uh, the conspirators here. Because by this time, by the time they discovered this, Sandra Spencer's still alive, but uh, uh, Knudsen is, has, has passed away. But his wife verified that he, he was summoned on Friday to go uh, photograph the autopsy and that he stayed away all weekend. And that when he came back, he said, boy, that was the toughest job I ever did. You know, I, I photographed the autopsy for the president. Now, there's absolutely no reason to think that, uh, that Knudsen was making this up. I mean, like I said, the guy's credibility, you can Google Robert Knudsen or look at his Wikipedia entry. I mean, this guy is stout. So there, it's, it's clear that, you know, he's... He's there, in his mind, photographing the autopsy. 
Now, here's another telltale sign. In the 1970s, Knudsen is summoned to, no, not summoned. He, he's asked to give an interview before a national photography magazine. Uh, and he tells th this magazine in this interview that he was the photographer for the autopsy. Now, if he's making this up, if he's lying about this, <laughs> this is not a smart thing to do because you know he's going to get called on it. He's going to be you know, labeled a liar, an official liar. Here's the White House photographer that has his stout history. So it's clear that he's not lying. Uh, it just wouldn't make any sense to be making this up and then publicizing it because too many people knew about the autopsy. Well, there's just one, <laughs> one big thing, one big problem with Knudsen's statement that he photographed the autopsy. He didn't. <laughs> he did not photograph the autopsy. Now, he obviously believed he was photographing something that looked like the autopsy and clearly the people that were doing this told him that this was the autopsy but if you go to the official autopsy everybody agrees that the official autopsy uh, photographer was a guy named John Stringer who, who worked with the Navy which made sense because he was there at Bethesda Naval Hospital but there's no question. I mean, Stringer testified. I, I was the official photographer. Everybody verified he was the official photographer. Newton was not there. That is an undisputed fact that Newton was not at the official autopsy. All right. So what was Newton doing then? Well, this, this is part of the mystery here. He was clearly photographing something which he was led to believe was the autopsy. And peop there were people who were leading him to believe that it was the autopsy. But we don't know what it was. Now, it, we, we, if we look back at this photograph of the back of President Kennedy's head that is shown to be intact, um, we have to wonder, did, did Knudsen take that photograph? Was the photograph altered in some way? Or was the body altered in such a way as to create the appearance that this back of the head was legitimate, that there's no hole there? Uh, these are the mysteries that, that we don't know. Now, what Newton's wife told the ARRB also was that he was summoned to testify at a proceeding in, I think it was the 1980s. It could be the 1970s, late 1970s. Um, he did testify before the House Select Committee on Assassinations, and that, that testimony is fascinating. In fact, you can Google um, my article Robert Knudsen at FFF.org, and I go into that. But there was another proceeding that he was asked to testify to, and we don't know what that is. There's no record of what that, that proceeding was. Very, part of the whole mystery of this, this uh, autopsy and this assassination. But he came back after doing that, and he told his wife, there are severe shenanigans with these photographs going on. And he wanted his wife to know that he played no role in this at all in case he died and the whole thing was going to blow up, that he wanted his reputation intact. And so he, he wanted to assure his wife that whatever happens here, and he didn't tell her in details because, remember, it's all classified. They, they told him it was classified too. Uh, and his position was, even though he went military, he understood you take classified um, information to the grave with you. He just wanted to assure his wife that if he passed away and then this thing blew up, that he was not part of it. So, it's, again, it's part of the fraud that was involved here. Um, and and, and, and that's, that's the thing that the mainstream press has never wanted to address. I mean, just think if they had, you know, gone after Knudsen to, to ask him questions, to interview him, to get to the bottom of this, saying, what's going on here? What were you uh, – uh, photographing. Tell us a, the, about the procedure there. Uh, they, they could have gotten uh, the, the military to, uh, like during the House Select Committee on Assassinations, to release him from his vow of secrecy. I mean, that's what happened in, in the 70s with the House Select Committee proceedings. Um, they gave, uh, they started releasing the enlisted men who had participated in the, in the autopsy uh, from their vows of secrecy, and then the enlisted men started talking. And they said they told a remarkable story, too, just like Sondra Spencer did, just like Robert Newton did. They started saying, well, we brought in the body 
in a cheap military-style shipping casket almost an hour and a half before the official entry of the body in the Dallas casket, which was this beautiful, ornate, expensive casket. Well, what the heck was going on with this? You know, when, when the Dallas casket was offloaded off Air Force One at Andrews Air Base, um, it was put into a Navy vehicle. Jacqueline Kennedy gets in there. Bobby Kennedy gets in there. It slowly starts making its way to, to Bethesda Naval Hospital. Uh, it's introduced into the, into the morgue at 8 p.m. These enlisted men start telling this shocking story that, well, no, we brought the body in the morgue at 6.35 p.m almost an hour and a half before the 8 p.m. time. Uh, and then the body was brought in there, and things were done there in that, in that hour and a half. Uh, shady things. Uh, and this is part of what's going on in the fraudulent autopsy, and this is what I go into in, in my two books, The Kennedy Autopsy and The Kennedy Autopsy Two, which, by the way, are really synopses of Douglas Horn's remarkable watershed five-volume book inside the Assassination Records Review Board which I highly recommend. It's a difficult read. I mean, you, they're like coffee table sized books, five volumes. But I guarantee you, you finish um, uh, Horn's five volume book, you will have no doubts that this was a fraudulent autopsy. Also, Horn has done a, I think it's a six or seven part uh, video series for FFF called Altered History, mostly on the autopsy, but also into why, why they killed Kennedy. And so I invite you to see that video series, along with a long video series that I've done that's, that's on the, uh, the FFF website. And then finally, there's uh, Douglas Horn's book, uh, JFK's War with the National Security Establishment, Why Kennedy Was Assassinated, that goes into the motive here. And that's an FFF book. Uh, it, it encapsulates the war that was taking place throughout the three years of the Kennedy administration. Uh, also, I should mention that the ARRB in the 1990s discovered the existence of a man like, named Roger Boyajin. He was a Marine sergeant on the weekend of the assassination. He tells the ARRB that it was his Marine team. He was in charge of the team that brought in the president's body at 6.35 p.m. in a cheap military-style shipping casket, kind of, the kind of caskets they use in the Vietnam War. And he actually had his written report with him. He had kept a copy of it, which the military had not turned over to the ARRB. And it, it said, the president's body brought in at 6.35 p.m. Into the, into the morgue. And it, it was a copy of the, the report that had been prepared a few days after the assassination. And it was all done in secret. The enlisted men all said that they were sworn to secrecy just after the assassination. They were warned that they would never, ever disclose what they had seen or done during this autopsy. They had to sign written vows of secrecy. They were threatened with court-martial or criminal prosecution uh, if they ever talked about what they had seen. And so they had kept their secret until the House Select Committee had released them and until Roger Boyajin was released from his vow of secrecy in the 1990s. So you can get a sense here that there's no question. This is not a theory. You know, you know the CIA puts out this line many years ago to its assets in the mainstream press that whenever you have somebody suggesting that, that we were engaged in nefarious activity here, that we orchestrated this assassination, call them a conspiracy theorist. Smear them that way. And that was, that was a strategy that the CIA came up with. And it's been, I think it's the most effective propaganda in U.S. history uh, because today the mainstream press is just scared to death to be called a conspiracy theorist. And there's a lot of people that are scared to death to be called a conspiracy theorist. And they say, oh, gosh, even libertarians I know are scared. And they say, oh, we don't want to go down the rabbit hole. We don't want to look at this. They're not scared to look at the regime change operations in Guatemala in 54 or Iran in 53 or in the Congo in 61 or in Cuba in 19, early 60s or 1973 Chile. They're not scared to look at all those, but you say, well, let's look at another one here, which took place in November 22nd, a domestic regime change operation, based on the same ground as those other regime change operations. National security, communist threat, uh, soft on communism, befriending the Soviet Union. Oh, boy, man, oh, no, no, I don't want to be called a conspiracy theorist. I don't want to be called a conspiracy theorist. Well, my position is this is part of our legacy. Just like Iran 53, Guatemala 54, Cuba, uh, you know, 
dagger at America's throat, assassination attempts, partnerships with the mafia to kill Castro, uh, uh, Chile, 1973. November 22nd, 1963, here in the United States, this is all part of American history. It's part of the national security state legacy, the legacy of having converted the federal government to a national security state after World War II. And, it, and it's, it's just time for Americans to embrace that legacy. Uh, well, embrace it in the sense of accepting it and, and dealing with it, confronting it. I mean, this country's never been the same since the Kennedy assassination, any more than the relations between Iran and the United States have been the same ever since the, uh, the coup that took the CIA instigated in that country in 53. Uh, I mean, these things have long-lasting uh, effects. But when you deny them, when you, when you try to live the life of the lie, it just aggravates the problem. That it, it's really time for us to look at the national security state, uh, what it was, what, why it was brought into existence, the whole Cold War racket, uh, to examine clearly what Kennedy was trying to do, and, and then get this country back on the right track. And, and the right track means, um, at least with respect to the warfare state, a restoration of a limited government republic. I mean, that was our founding governmental system, and that necessarily means a dismantling of the national security state system, uh, the ones that have affected all these regime change operations. And, and, you know, they may have thought they were acting patriotically and protecting national security, but it really goes to show you the, the monstrous outcomes when you have this totalitarian structure called a national security state. I mean, North Korea is a national security state. Cuba is a national security state. Russia, China and post-World War II United States. We need to restore a limited government republic, which just has a basic military force that's designed to protect the United States from an invasion, which is a non-existent uh, possibility, and America's foreign policy of foreign interventionism. Ditch the NSA entirely. Don't try to reform these surveillance programs. Don't try to rein in the FISA court and all that nonsense. Get rid of the NSA, get rid of the CIA entirely, get rid of the Pentagon, have a basic uh, military force that's just designed to, to galvanize and, and uh, get the country ready in case there's ever an invasion, which is, again, is a non-existent possibility. Just a necessary prerequisite for a free society. And so that's why the Kennedy assassination still has relevance. I hear from young people sometimes, well, what, why is this relevant to us? <laughs> I said, you live under a national security state, don't you? Well, the national security state is the most powerful part of the federal government. It, it, it effectively rules the federal government. Now, there's a great book by Michael Glennon that I recommend. Now, Glennon make, takes no position on the, on the uh, Kennedy assassination. I don't even know where he stands on it. It, it doesn't matter. Glennon is professor of law at Tufts University. He has served as a counsel for a U.S. Senate committee, I think, on foreign affairs. The guy knows what he's talking about. And his, his uh, book, uh, National Security and Double Government, posits that the real power of the federal government is with the national security establishment. It's, it's essentially a fourth branch of government. And that they permit the other three branches to have the veneer of power because they don't care about that. What matters to them is that they have the real power. They're the ones really running the federal government. And that's why this assassination back in 63 is still relevant to young people today because you're living under the system that brought this about, along with all the other regime change operations. I mean, that's the root of the problem with the U.S. and Iran is what the, the CIA did in 1953. These things have long-lasting effects. And so what we need to do, obviously everybody involved in the assassination is dead, but what we need to do is, is confront this assassination just like other regime change operations, examine it, realize it, acknowledge that this is part of our national security state legacy as a national security state, and then start talking about what we need to do to move this country in a better, freer, more prosperous, harmonious direction, and that means the restoration of a limited government republic. That's the Libertarian Angle for this, this week. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and uh, again, come to FFF.org. Uh, this is our end-of-year fundraising time. We greatly need your support for the coming year, we've got a lot of big challenges, as you all know, for the coming year. We could really use your support. And, of course, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thank you so much, and a happy Thanksgiving to all of you.